Welcome to the KBB Review Podcast. I'm Andy Davis. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do about that. And this is episode three of season 10. This week, we're going to look at something really interesting that's been around for quite a long time, but hasn't really managed to get much traction with retailers when it probably should. And that's the water label. Now, in a nutshell, it's the water efficiency equivalent of the energy ratings label that all appliances have to display. I'm sure you're all very familiar with them. It's a scheme that's been developed by bathroom manufacturers, basically under the auspices of a body called the Unified Water Label Association, which is led by today's guest, Yvonne Orgill. Now, hang on straight away. I can almost hear you switching off and putting Joe Rogan on instead. So why is the water label something that showroom retailers need to be much more aware of? After all, I can telepathically hear you say clients don't want products that use less water. They want ones that use more. Well, imagine a scenario where every tap, shower, WC, dishwasher and anything else in your showroom that uses water has to, by law, have a water efficiency label hanging off it. What will that mean for your beautiful displays, your sales story, your journey around the showroom and your own ability to explain it knowledgeably to every customer? Especially as, unlike the energy label on the appliances, the water efficiency of a tap or shower is as much influenced by the user's habits as it is anything else. Now, the Unified Water Label, developed here in the UK, has been accepted across Europe as the industry standard. However, just a few weeks ago, the UK government announced that it was going to develop a totally separate water label from scratch, essentially rejecting the existing scheme. Thank you, Brexit. And the new label, when it arrives, will be mandatory in your showroom. So I met up with Unified Water Label Managing Director Yvonne Orgill at a recent event, and we talked it all through. But first... If you run a KBB retail business, are there young members of your team that you think are absolute stars? Are they grafters who also show amazing initiative and bring fresh ideas? Are they destined for great things in this industry? If so, then they deserve to be entered into the rising star of the year category at the KBB Review Retail and Design Awards 2024. To be nominated, they have to be under 30 on the closing date of November the 16th. Now, of course, we've also got categories for best kitchen and bathroom designers, overall retailers, showroom design, best installation company, and incidentally, that includes retailers who do their own fitting, and the supplier team of the year. In other words, there's something for everyone, and it's totally free to enter. In fact, if you're shortlisted, you'll get to come to the big Glamorous Awards event for free too. However, the closing date for entries is 5pm on Thursday, November the 16th, so time is running out. Head along to kbbreview.com forward slash awards to find out everything you need to know. That's kbbreview.com forward slash awards, and that link is in the episode description. Now, over to my chat with Yvonne Orgill from the Unified Water Label. The best place to start here, and you're going to hate me for making the old go all the way back to the beginning, but let's start with what the water label actually is for those that aren't familiar with it. Because I think lots of people have heard of it, sort of know what it is, but can you fill in the gap with a little bit more detail about it? The water label is a marketing and sales tool to help people identify how much water that product uses if it's used in accordance with manufacturer's instruction. It's simple, credible and honest and will give you only water flow. However... Over its journey, we have added energy dial in there to show how much energy you're using on the hot water side. So the nearest equivalent is, I guess, the or the ones that everyone will be familiar with is the energy label that goes on appliances. It's not the same as that, but the principle is the same. It's to give consumers an idea of what amount of water, the amount of energy that that particular product will use. Research has shown over the decades that consumers like labels and their labels to ensure that they have sufficient education information to make an informed choice up to purchase that's what labels are now the water label is as close as without emulating the energy label because consumers automatically relate to the energy label and if anybody asked well what does the energy label mean Consumers haven't got a clue on the technical criteria, Mm. but they know that A-rated is better than the G-rated. And the water label is very similar. They know that the green delivers less water than the red. And it's just about informed choice to make that selection for the family that you're selling into. 
Okay, so the principle's there, and it's obvious that in this day and age, you know, all the environmental concerns, but also water meters and hot water, some the amount of energy goes into hot water, that knowing how much water your products use when you're buying a new bathroom or kitchen is clearly incredibly important. However, unlike the energy labels on appliances, I suppose the barrier is performance. So if something I want to shower that uses loads of water and every retail, every retail will tell you that consumers walk in, that's what they ask for. So I guess the barrier with the water label has always been about selling the argument that it doesn't necessarily mean a drop in performance. The how low can you go comes into question here. With the energy label, it's all appliances with a plug on the end and as long as it's got a plug and you switch it on and it works, happy days. With water, if water isn't coming out of the appliance, the tap, the shower, or, or for the WC to flush, then you think, hey, hang on a minute, something's wrong here. So it is about performance. Performance is key, along with behaviour, because it's the amount of water that's wasted, not the amount of water it's used. Now, over the decade, manufacturers have been very, very clever in picking up the cudgels of Yes, we need to conserve water or use it in a more effective way. And therefore, they've been using innovation and technology to bring to market products that deliver the performance that customers are looking for, but use less water, less energy. Now, the label will indicate how much water. And there's a new standard that's about to to come out early 2024 that maintains the performance of a tap and a shower so customers one aren't dissatisfied and two don't go tampering with the product causing themselves even more harm and damage to the property and a lot of retailers will already be selling these products probably without even ever looking at it particularly with systems and things like that where the rules have been around for a long time so it's more a case of you, you probably use it already you just don't know enough about what it is because it's maybe it's not ubiquitous enough in the market, would that be fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right there, Andrew. There's a lot of people that don't realise that their shower head probably has three to five settings and the pulsating aspect of the shower gives you the satisfaction, not necessarily the performance, the satisfaction, that feel-good factor. Mm. Most people don't know that. And some of those settings will use even more or less water because they've got eco-settings and all sorts in there. And it's about the retailers using the USP of the product to make the sale. And they need to understand that water efficiency isn't poor performance product, not today. It was 20, 30 years ago, but manufacturers have been very clever uh, and, and got their innovation in there and technology. So there's a lot of standards, politics, certificates, all this kind of palaver that goes along with introducing standards, whether it's in water efficiency or anything else. So we'll go into that in a minute. But I think what we really need to do here is, is get to the bottom of why this is important to retailers who own a showroom, because all this sort of happens over in a factory somewhere or gets printed on a box and there's nothing to do with them. But if I owned a showroom, why is this important to me? Why do I need to know about this stuff? Right. If it becomes law that you have to have a mandatory label in the UK. When the majority of products are imported, you can end up with dual labelling on the literature in the box. If you've ever bought a new TV recently, you've got about a 70-page guide and it's split into 10 languages and it's only three or four pages that are relevant for you. Retailers will have something similar. You will have to label every product that you have on display in your showrooms and manufacturers will have to carry a mandatory label in all their product literature, on their packaging and also on their websites to ensure that the consumers have access to that information. So what does that mean for a retailer? Say they've got 20 bathroom displays on show and each one's got a bath, a tap, a shower, a WC everyone's going to have a label on. Now, Mrs. Consumer comes into the showroom and she'll then want to know, well, what does that mean for me as a bathroom suite? So you've gone from the individual label right the way through to what does that mean for me completely? Yes, there's a lot of subjective finger-in-the-air calculations going on, but on the whole, government's quest is to drive water use down to 110 litres per person per day. 
and the retailer will play a part in educating consumers on how much water they use. And what is it now? It's a roughly, depends on whose stats you're looking at, it's a roughly around 142 litres. So that's quite a big drop. Do your own calculation. Yeah, it's doable. Can you do it? I only use 105 litres per person per day in my home because when you calculate it all out, because you use top washing machines, dishwashers, I've only got short hair, you start to be a bit more water-wise. I suppose one of the differences between appliances, for example, appliances are like a fixed cycle, or they're either on or they're off, like a fridge, or a washing machine, dishwasher, they're a fixed cycle, you press the button and they go through it, where so much of water use in the bathroom or kitchen, with the tap in the kitchen, it's about how long you leave it on for. Yep. There's such a personal control over it, which is where knowing how, what the efficiency of it is is much more nuanced yet important. You need an education programme mm. alongside it. You, you need to be able to understand, well, what does six litres a mini actually mean? That's six litres of Coke bottle or water bottles <laughs> that you now need to say, well, that's what's coming out of that tap every minute that you leave it on. I'm a great believer in electric toothbrushes because you d- basically don't use much water at all. You rinse the head, but that's saving 12 in the morning, 12 at night, 24 litres per person per day that you don't need to be using. I mean, half the water usage in my house is my teenage son having a shower because he's literally in there for about three or four days at a time. Drives me nuts. Anyway, that's not important. So uh, as far as retail is concerned, A, you've got to know about it because people are going to ask about it because it's going to be there and fudge them. Yeah. And B, these retail displays that they spend so much time on and they're very beautiful looking room sets are going to have a label hanging off every single every product. product. Yeah. But are we literally talking about a label hanging off every tap or can you have just one on the wall next to the tap? I mean, how is it? Let's use the analogy of the energy label. Go into any electrical appliance retailer. Everyone that's on display has a label on the front, right? So that's your bathroom. Everyone will have a display because that's what government will expect. And as you say, you're going to have to explain what it means because you can't avoid it. Okay, so we know why it's important. Give us a little bit of the history of it because you've sort of started this whole thing. Can you give us an idea of the sort of potted history of the thing, of when it started and where we are now? 2005, I got the major manufacturer in the UK to support the idea that the industry should have a label. I kept hearing it in different forums that we were attending. 2007, the technical, the first technical criteria had been written and the first product labelled 1st of September. Lessico were the first one to register product. 2009, it went to Europe because Europeans could see the benefit of industry having a label on the products. So 2009, the English version became Europeanised. Same standards, European standards, and then along came Brexit. And Brexit was a headache that we had to overcome. But the industry remained European, and therefore the whole of the bathroom industry, where a majority of the products come from, decided that their label was the right tool and that's where they've continued to support it. And that's what's happened. And then the UK government decided that they want want a mandatory label following their research, which you can question all the way through it. They quote the Australian Water Sense. Now, Water Sense is recognised in ISO 31600, Mm -hmm. International Standard on Water Labelling, but so is the European water label that we know today as the unified water label. OK, let's <laughs> recap a little bit. <laughs> so you, you're starting to get all, 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 all European directives on me. <laughs> so, first of all, one of the reasons why you started all this, because I know, because we, we, we've been talking about this for years, is you could see, I mean, the, the, the four sides of the prescience, to, to see if the market doesn't come up with its own version of this, it will eventually get a, a, a label thrust upon them by people who don't really understand what's going on. So that's basically been your argument for 10 years, or nearly 20 years now. So you've got to the point where, and, it's, and, and you've driven this all the way through, where the UWLA, the Unified Water Label, is accepted across Europe by most of the massive manufacturers that sell in the UK. And your argument up to that point was, look, people just need to use it more, they need to get it out there, manufacturers need to do more to market it and get it out into showrooms, etc. And then, as you say, along comes Brexit. So the British government then launched its own consultation, its own inquiry into the validity of our water label and making it a mandatory system. So what did you think at that point? You must have thought, fantastic, there's one you can get out of the box, mate, here it is. To a certain extent, yes. 
But I'm also a firm believer that industry should actually be the driver of its own destiny mm. and work with governments, not against governments. So I was very disappointed with UK government at a time where they're cost-cutting, you know, Rishi yeah. Sunak's finding out where, where can he pinch pennies from everywhere that they then want to waste 27 million quid of taxpayers' money on a labelling scheme that would be identical to the one that the industry's already driving forward. So this is the results of the consultation. This came out a couple of weeks ago. And basically what they said was, water label, great, we love the idea. We think there should be a mandatory water label. OK, fair enough. But we're going to start our own one from scratch, virtually. Yep. So when I read that report, I just thought, Why? I can see why they might take your scheme and think, OK, we need to tweak that and change that, and that doesn't apply as much to this, because they want to include dishwashers and wash machines, things in it, which yours doesn't currently. But you've already been anticipating that for a while anyway, of, of expanding its reach. So you know these people, you talk to DEFRA, you've been part of the consultation. Why do they feel they need to start a whole new scheme from scratch? They don't trust industry. A lot of government departments have limited trust in industry. But the Unified Water Label has been developed and written as close to eco-design as it could possibly do. So it's got all the relevant aspects in there. It just beggars Billy. Is it the idea that they make an assumption that a label developed by the industry is going to naturally favour the industry, whereas the government's view will be it's got to be a consumer-facing device? This is going to make life easier for manufacturers, not consumers. It won't favour the manufacturer because within the consultation response report, it states that they want third-party compliance certification, which means manufacturers are going to be facing a £50 million bill on trying to find the capacity in test laboratories to certify their products, not just to a mandatory label, but to compliance of all the regulations that are currently out there. And there's two or three that really do conflict which one takes precedent. So the label will be more or less similar to what we currently have, but it will have all the technical criteria certification behind it, and manufacturers won't benefit. And manufacturers are going to pick up the bill for that, um, that's which ultimately right. means their customers will pick up the bill well, for that. they won't be able to keep some of it. They'll have to cross-charge yeah. some of it, yeah? Yeah, it just, it just seems like such a strange argument to pick when there isn't an argument to have. It just That's, that's what came across to me with it. Because, for example, it's not just developing literally the label, what's it going to look like, you know, what's the actual grading going to look like. But you've got a huge database of products that are certified with the water label. And presumably they've then got to start that database again from scratch. Yeah. We've got about 160 brands supporting the label. Not just manufacturers, merchants, retailers. They're on there with a database of 17,000 individual products. And presumably this doesn't affect what happens in Europe, as you say. So if you're, I don't know, Rocker or Vitra or one of the European manufacturers, you're going you're to have your European water label, your water label, and then you'll have to have a completely separate one in the UK. DEFRA stated that it would be a UK-only label. So what happens to Northern Ireland? We all know the issues. And They're not allowed to have any toilets in Northern Ireland. I think that's the, that's the Brexit deal, I think. <laughs> They'll all get a spade yeah. for the gone. <laughs> They'll all go into the RSC. <laughs> but these are the complexities that have got to be worked out. It's so odd when these things get so legislative. They become so tied up in politics and meetings and committees and standards sit in a room for an hour and nothing happens or you, or at the very least you go backwards every single time you have a discussion with somebody different. It must drive you nuts. It is very difficult. It is challenging because they're not technical experts that sit in some of these forums. Yes. They're water utilities. They are local authorities. I'm not saying that they haven't got the experience or information, but they don't understand the nuances of putting together a toilet, putting together a shower and what, what are the consequences of, of the water flow through either product. We touched on it earlier on, didn't we? One of the things is, OK, you can have the label, and you get the label on every product in all the showrooms, but a huge part of this is about nudging your consumer to think differently, isn't it? I mean, I've seen some great products that have a timer on the shower and all these kind of things about changing habit and changing behaviour, and I think it'd be good to see a bit more conversation about that coming out of the government that it, and water companies and that they were about arguing over the well, international label. As you've said, Andrew, I've been uh, on this path for many, many years. Yeah. <laughs> Label your product, 
educate mm. consumers, but unless they change behaviour, you're not saving one drop of water. But this is where the influence of the retailer and the showroom and the installer, this is where it all comes in, to, isn't it? To, to a certain through. extent, the, the retailer or the installer will influence the purchasing of the product, right? So the, the retailer can say, yeah, an 8-litre shower will give you an experience of a 15-litre-a-minute shower. But go back to the story of your son, 30 minutes in the shower, he ain't saving anything. No. And your electricity bill isn't going down either. I'll so, just give him less food, it's fine. <laughs> it is about behaviour. Mm. And for me, government should be saying, industry's got a label, we think it's great, we'll use it because it's based on global influences. And we will put our money behind an education programme mm. for consumers. They've done it for food, they've done it for plastic waste, and they can do it for water labelling. Can you see a stage where, effectively, some classifications of products are banned? Yes. And it says that in the report. By 2035, they're looking at minimum standard. What does that mean? Can't have a shower above six? I don't know. But these are the things that if you've given control or influencing factors to government, then... They'll just run rough shadows here. The showrooms are always the last to change. So they'll start with house builders and construction and then they'll come to private landlords and then they end up with the, the showrooms or dealing with individual homeowners. That's the, the order it kind of goes. I mean, we're in a hotel right now. I can see a point where no new hotels will be built with baths in, for example. Right. No, that's right. Um, they're already doing it through building regs. Yeah. So we've got to look carefully on, what, on the direction of building regs. They're already on about fittings approach. They've got taps in their basin taps at six litres a minute. Well, if you look at the water label, you will see that majority of taps sold today are no more than six. So industry's already on that reduction programme. But there are certain people that need more water, have health, wellness, mental issues. They like to feel it. They, it makes them feel better. Don't ban things. Let's let's try and work together. But that's the bit that I struggle with. Why won't people work together? Well, the difference between bathroom industry and the kitchen industry is that the bathroom industry is so driven by construction and so driven by big projects. The product developments and everything is driven by what will go into big housing developments or big flats or hospitals or schools or hotels or whatever it is. And because they are <coughs> so controlled by legislation, in a way... The retailers will end up having no choice because the only products available or being developed will be ones that fit all these standards anyway. So just take that analogy. It'll make it even harder to sell one brand against another brand because your USPs have all gone. Yeah. Because legislation has driven it that way. So it will be price. It will be some marketing people have got to come up with some great innovative ideas of how their USPs fit because... If water's not coming out the end of it, I ain't buying it. Or you've got to flush it twice, or whatever it is. Yeah. Or, or put more bleaching down. It's very easy for things to tie themselves up in knots. We have this whole thing with CE marking. There's still a lot of product in the market that is effectively shouldn't be sold. Marking. Yeah, it yeah. shouldn't be shouldn't be being sold and get shipped over here. And here's another rule that comes into place. And the problem always is, as ever, is who is going to enforce it? How is it going to be enforced? Is someone going to march into your showroom and point at things? They haven't got a label and shut your showroom up for the day. It means nothing without any teeth, does it? No. We have two bodies. We've got Trading Standards and the OPSS. Which is? Office of Product Safety and Standards. The structure's there. It's not well funded. <coughs> but their priorities are products that will harm, main, injure yeah. the consumer. Saving water isn't going to be high on their agenda. Um and the regulator, which is the water utilities, don't have the manpower to go out there and to make sure that every product is compliant. So this is why they're trying to look at doing it through standards. And it's not necessarily the, the way forward. A certificate can be copied. So you do need foot patrol. And that's not going to work, is it? No, it can't see a kind of bathroom police kicking your door in because you haven't got a label hanging off a tap. Perhaps there's a, a new career coming, Andy. <laughs> it's only my time for that's like a Channel 5 series, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Bathroom police emergency. Yeah. Well, 
But that's always the problem with, with these kind of schemes or any kind of scheme, isn't it? It's, it's, it's all very well saying you have to do it, but if no one's making you, it's reaching that momentum, that critical mass. But it did happen with the energy label on appliances because they're everywhere. How did that work? Why has that become a ubiquitous thing that everyone knows? Well, they've gone through an awful lot of change. They've moved with the market. Bureaucracy crept in not that long ago. The, um, an A-rated and a C-rated were actually the same rating. There were some products entering the market that were booking the system and 30,000 uh, products across Europe were tested and majority were found not to be displaying the correct one. But bear in mind, how long has the energy label been out there? 30 years, if not more. But it's back to put a plug on, switch it on, it works. Does it work effectively? Well, that's another story. Turn the tap on and nothing comes out. It's not that it's inefficient, it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Plus, I guess there is <coughs> other factors like water pressure and you know, your boiler level and all those other things that will affect how much is coming out and how fast it goes. And, and th th there's the nuance of our, of our market. We've got probably 60% on high pressure now, 40% on low pressure. You put a low pressure system on a high pressure system and you'll get a fireman's hose out of that, of that product. Those complexities exist in our market today and therefore no one mandatory system will work correctly. Let's try and work out what the timeline is here. We've had the consultation. They've said they've pretty much concluded this is what they want, but as you say, the battle's not over yet. What is the timeline of this? What, what kind of markers in the sand have they put in for when things might happen, when a mandatory label might come in, when a showroom might have to start putting labels on everything? Showrooms should automatically be using the unified water label now. Get themselves used to using the label, use the industry label. Government has already said they would like to introduce by 2025 a mandatory water label. Well, come on, let's get real. We've got stakeholder meetings to have to work out the technical criteria, the look of the label and how it's going to go forward. And then we've got an election. Is the incoming government going to be supportive of wasting 27 million quid? And that's before a mandatory label by DEFRA is implemented. And there's got to be a transition period. And normally, transitions periods are between 18 months and two years. So that's taking you up to 2027 anyway. And DEFRA is renowned for being slow. And they've said in that consultation report that they want to work with you. How willing are you to work with them now that they've basically said they don't want to use your label? Because they might come to you and say, can we have your database, please? Or My question would be to you, Andrew. After working on this label since 2005 and where we've got to today yeah. and somebody wants to close your business down, take all your intellectual property, what would you say? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing I can record on this particular podcast, Yvonne. <laughs> That's part of the argument or part of the process that has to take place at this point on, isn't it? Because they are, they have to work with the industry. They have to ask people to develop these standards. Who are they going to ask if it's not you or not people from some of the big suppliers or manufacturers that already work with you? This other mystical panel of people that you don't know, the Illuminati of Bath. They're not. And really, we've got to work on what's best for the manufacturers. And for me, what's best for the industry is for government to wake up, smell the coffee and to use what's already been developed. Rishi Suna, in his closing speech at the Conservative Party, said he wanted to work with small businesses on environment. And here is DEFRA about to close one of the small businesses that has worked endlessly and tirelessly to develop a labelling scheme that is recognised on the global platform under ISO 31600. Well, you have worked very hard at it for a very, very long time, and I've followed this whole journey as you've done it, and I find it fascinating that, that all this stuff sort of goes on behind the scenes. Imagine a lot of retailers sit in showrooms selling product. They don't realise that all this stuff has to happen in rooms somewhere. You know, standards are developed, and it might be from whether it's a water label, whether it's a how big the thread is on a tap or whatever it is. These are all standards that someone somewhere has decided, and, and I find that kind of minutia of things quite fast. I don't want to be in those meetings. Let me just stress that. I don't want to be in the deciding the thread on a tap meeting, but I find it fascinating that those things happen. So keep fighting the good fight. We have to, don't we? Because 160 brands, 17,000 products, we haven't got it wrong. So fight for what you believe, and you're right. 
some of those meetings are really, really tough, but you have to keep going, you know, and with the support of the BMA behind us and the manufacturers as well, then I think we, we, we have a good chance of winning the war. Yeah. So that was Yvonne Orgill, the Managing Director of the Unified Water Label Association. And as I said in there, this is the stuff that goes on behind the scenes when new initiatives, standards and laws are set, and they do directly affect your business. I've said this before, but for the UK government to hit all the environmental targets it has committed itself to, it will have to bring in dozens, if not hundreds, of mandatory schemes in a very short space of time. And I suspect it's business owners that will feel the brunt of them. You can find out more about the Unified Water Label at uwla.eu, and I'll put that link in the episode description, along with the link to the KBB Review Retail and Design Awards 2024. Remember, it's totally free to enter, but entries close on November the 16th. I'll see you next time. Thank you.